Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what we are going to be discussing and dissecting for installment number six, we are already six weeks in this series. What we are going to be discussing and dissecting for installment number six of our firefighter series is so necessary and so needed because the authentic follower of Jesus needs community. We know that to be true mainly because the scriptures inform us of this truth and throughout this sermonic presentation I'm going to show you several passages of scripture that could better corroborate my claim and alley oop what I'm attempting to articulate to you. Every authentic follower of Jesus needs community. But we just don't need community. We need our community to be biblical, on fire for the things of God, and healthy. One more again. Not one more time. One more again. We all need community. Somebody say, we need this. But it must be biblical, on fire for the things of God, and healthy. And if you're not there yet, that's okay. That's okay. Anybody who keeps saying, I'm not there, please do not let the devil lie to you and make you think that you have to be at some super spiritual place before you can fellowship with other believers. Hear me. Once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are immediately a part of the body of Christ. So stop saying when I get there, when my mind gets there, when my lust stops getting there, the there. All there is, is a ceiling to a former floor or a ceiling to the next floor. So if you don't get what you need here, you will be under equipped for when you get there. So it's not when I get there, it's God help me maximize here. It's not God get me out of this, it's God what am I supposed to get out of this if you're not there yet that's okay you're still a part of the body and you need community if you're detoxing that's okay you're still a part of the body and you still need community if you are struggling trying to shake off the icicles of what died in your life in winter a divorce relational death a dream died a hope died a vision died Whatever it is in your life that you're struggling to shake off because you, you feel as though my heart's starting to get cold in the area. I'm trying to convince you that the body of Christ is packed with body heat and fire melts ice. Don't miss this, please. Whatever in your heart is starting to get cold because of what happened. Your perspective is forming icicles. Your thoughts are performing icicles. The body of Christ is packed with fire and fire melts ice. There are certain things, if I was a note taker, I'd write this down. There are certain things you don't get from teaching, you only get from touch. Talk Holy Spirit. I see I'm at the plow today. There are certain things you don't get from teaching. You only get from touch. Because certain fires are lit while others are caught. You may not get on fire for what I do. But if you come to small group, maybe Herbert will start a fire. And James, you caught it. Sanchez, you caught it. And so now in your marriage, you can light it. Now in your community, community you can light it because all fires won't happen from the pulpit. Some things you don't get from teaching, you only get from touch. This is why greeters, you have to be careful. Hmm. Parking lot ministry, you have to be careful. Because before they ever get teaching, they ran in touch with you. And so, I mean, I really don't care, but we can get reviews on Google, not about the word, but about your touch. Because your touch can be positive or negative. Is this making sense? There are certain things that I, I really don't, I don't get from touch, get from teaching, I get from touch. In other words, how much you care will always outweigh how much you know. I know my purpose. I know my gifting. I know my calling. 
I know the Bible, all 39 books in the old, 27 in the new. I know. I got a degree in seminary in divinity. Okay, that's great. But nobody cares about how much Bible you know. The question is, how do you treat people? That part, though. No, nobody cares about your Christian hashtags on social media. How do you treat people? Nobody cares about your Jesus bumper sticker that you have on the back of your car. How do you treat people? Nobody cares that you have God first statements in your bio. How do you treat people? See, and we have to get this part right. I'm about to walk heavy. And some people don't like it, and that's okay. I've learned how to enjoy the rain so the thunder of criticism doesn't phase me. Doesn't phase me. Suffering for the cause of Christ, I'm about that life. I'm ten toes down in advancing the kingdom agenda and restoring health to our communities and witness integrity versus having preachers who will lay hands on your wife behind your back. And I'm not talking about prayer. We need to restore health and witness integrity versus having our student pastors sleep with your teenagers. Priests molest our young boys and deacons embezzle money from the church. Greeters, you're smiling, walking around in church, and your husband looking at you like, who is she? Can I get that same type of energy at home? This is why some men don't like pastors now, because don't you dare honor a pastor more than you honor your husband. You don't know my flaws. You don't know my failures. You don't know my inadequacies. You don't know my shortcomings. Tanisha does. So you don't honor somebody that you don't know more than somebody that you do know. It's getting real quiet. Some pastors won't preach that. Some apostles won't preach that. Some bishops won't preach that. But I'm telling you now, keep that same energy at home for your husband. If you can smile, if you can shake hands for everybody in the parking lot, make sure that you can do it with your spouse. <laughs> we need health to return to our communities, witness integrity. So what you're going to do is you're going to pass out on the altar. Shout like you lost your mind in church. Leave here, go home, record explicit sexual content, and upload it to your OnlyFans page, and you just were laid out on the altar? Why y'all looking cray-cray? <laughs> Somebody say witness integrity. That's what we need. And... I know it can be rough, but I, I preach from obedience. I preach from my deeply rooted love for Jesus. I preach so that the prodigal can come home. I, I, I preach so that the lost can be found, the curious can come taste and see, and God can get all the glory out my life. This is for him and not for ourselves, and we need truth. Therefore, let's speak around this thought from this subject for part six of our firefighter series. Body heat, body heat, body heat. You are the body of Christ, and there's just some fire you're only going to get from the body. Sunday's not enough. If you work out one day a week, you're always going to be out of shape. <laughs> always. If you eat once a week, you're going to starve throughout the week. What feeds you throughout the week? Body heat and intentional devotion. And when I say body heat, let me give you a definition so that you can understand for the rest of this sermon what I mean. Body heat is a community of authentic followers of Jesus who collectively make up his body and who are engulfed with the fire of God. That is body heat. It is a community of authentic followers of Jesus who collectively make up his body and who are engulfed with the fire of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. Paul was really trying to get the church of Corinth to understand, hey, we're many members of one body. The eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the shoulder, I don't need you. We need every part. And what I discovered in my own life, you don't know how much you use a member of your body until it's injured. Sprain your ankle. You didn't know, man, I used my ankle to do this. To do. It will show you that one area that's hurting 
can affect every area of your body. Y'all ever had a bad crook in your neck? I'm talking about when you turn like this. Jerry, yes. Your back is connected to it. Your shoulders are connected to it. Even when I'm eating, I'm like, ooh. It, all of it is connected because all of us collectively make up the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So there's no jealousy amongst Christians. There's no jealousy amongst Christians because the right heart is if they got blessed, it just reminds me my God is a blesser. And I can rejoice with you. Notice those who never applaud when you win. That's a whole other sermon. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. Somebody say body heat. Body. Psalms 131 verse 1. The psalmist says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. One more time. Somebody say body heat. Body. Now, Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 25, these are for everybody who's struggling to digest this truth that I'm attempting to articulate. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together, as in the matter of some, but this is what you should do. Exhort one another. How can you exhort one another if you're isolated? How can you build each other up if you're isolated? Hear me. Some things you don't get through teaching, you only get through touch. There's this confession I want all of us to say. Everybody watching online, if you could put this in the room in all caps, I need us to say this so that we could really get this click thing out of the body of Christ, this mafia mentality out of the body of Christ. My church better than your church, out of the body of Christ. My pastor's more anointed than your pastor, out of the body of Christ. We praise dance better than you, out of the body of Christ. We all wear Team Jesus over here. That's it. I don't have to hit the gang winning shot. If you shoot and you want, I want too. So let's all say this. Can I get us to say, Father, thank you for my brothers and my sisters of the kingdom. Help us have unity. And purity, and purity as we burn for you, burn for you. I'm, a I'm a bodybuilder one more time father, father thank, you thank you for my brothers and my sisters of the kingdom, of the kingdom. Help, us help us have unity and purity, and purity. as we burn for you, burn for you. I'm a bodybuilder body y'all act like you buff say I'm a bodybuilder yeah, I build up my brothers. I build up my sisters. I build you up with joy. I build you up with confidence. I build you up with hope. I build you up with integrity. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm trying to help somebody on today for the individual who is struggling. And you're fighting extremely hard to not let your heart get cold due to the frostbite of betrayal. The frost of somebody who stabbed you in the back. And this is the irony. The very person that you would take a bullet for is the same person behind the trigger. <laughs> Can we talk? Because most of the pain Jerry has ever felt has never come from my enemies. It's always come from people who told me, I love you. I love you. And it hurts. Could it be possible that somewhere in our life, we learned to be loved is to be needed? Let me talk to somebody. Stop judging the effectiveness of your fire by those who won't get warmed by your heat. One more time. Stop judging the effectiveness of your fire due to the people who won't come and get warm by your heat. 
struggling right now, listening to this message, possibly trying to hold back tears because the icicles of resentment are forming on your heart and they're forming on your perspective. And I'm trying to convince somebody the benefit of Christian fellowship is we're packed with body heat and fire melts ice. Some things you don't get through teaching, you only get through touch. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell with each other in unity. I need you to know that you're the body of Christ, members individually. So forsake not the assembly of yourselves like some people do, but you exhort one another. Body heat, body heat, body heat. For the individual under the sound of my voice in the sacred sanctuary overflow are watching online and you're fighting very hard within your soul because this is your most common statement. I'm good. <laughs> I'm straight. I don't do people. I'm a one-man army. You do you. I'm going to do me. I don't need no duet. I'm cool with a solo. It ain't me against the world. It's just me, period. I do me. And you do you. For all of those who have adopted that belief system, and that methodology to be the best way to protect your heart, which causes for you to engage in self-imposed isolation. Let me talk to you. All of the pain quarantined. I don't want to feel that, so I'm going to isolate from it. I don't want to give off that, so I'm going to isolate from it. L let me talk to you. You were not created to be an island. Hear me. Our eternal king did not create you to be an island. I get it. I hear you. When pain hits, you become an island that's separated by the sea of misunderstanding. Because loneliness is not always the separation of company. Loneliness can be the separation of clarity. It's when you're not clear on a season or a people. I need to say that one more time. Loneliness is not always the separation of company, but rather it's the separation of clarity. It's when you're not clear on a season or a people. So you're not clear that you're in a season of detox. You're not clear that you're in a season of becoming. You're not clear that you're in a season of harvest. Because believe it or not, every season is not meant to be endured. Some are meant to be enjoyed. But you can't enjoy it because your default coping mechanism is to isolate. Isolate. I don't need nobody. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm straight. Matter of fact, the next time I'm opening up is at my autopsy. <laughs> Isolated. You could be in the season where God's trying to show you what's affecting your personality that's not you. Because hear me, whatever you don't deal with in this season will always show up in the next season front row in your reactions. Man, they never reacted like that. They never responded like that. What's wrong with them? That's the residue of what was never dealt with from the last season. And now we're sitting in the front row of their reactions, their perspective, and the way they respond because they didn't deal with it. They didn't deal with what hurt. And so now you find yourself trying to not let icicles form on your heart or on your mind. And I'm trying to convince somebody trying to convince somebody that authentic Christian fellowship comes with heat and fire melts ice. Some things you're not going to get through teaching. You're only going to get through, y'all talk to me, touch. Loneliness is not just the separation of company, but rather it's the separation of clarity. It's to not be clear on a season or a people. I articulated this to us before. Whenever God sends somebody in your life, they will always assist the new you. Whenever hell sends somebody in your life, they will assault the new you. When they're from Yahweh, they will assist your new walk. They will assist your godliness. They will assist your purity. That's how you can tell whoever's praying, God, is this from you? If they assist the new life. For in Christ, we are new creatures. If they assist that, they come from Yahweh. If they assault, you don't have to do that. Don't nobody do that. It don't take all that. That's a sign they're from the enemy. 
You just have to be so secure that when God gives you a new walk, you don't take on an old walk to keep them. Can I go a little deeper? The only, reason, the only reason some of us are still slaves to certain things is because your friends are still on the plantation. <laughs> and the only reason you won't leave the bondage is because that's your friends. In some cases, that's your family. That's my cousin. That's my kinfolk. And God is saying the gate from the prison cell is open. The only reason you're sleeping in that bunker is because you have history with them. And I'm trying to make you have history with them so you can live out his story in your life. Amen. Somebody say body heat. Body heat. Body heat. I, want, I want to show you this in scripture where we can see how this all connects. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. So we can see the benefit of kingdom community. I'm telling you, a lot of my greatest freedom didn't happen because I sat where you're sitting. It was a small group. It was in talking to a brother. I needed to know I wasn't the only brother fighting for purity. When I could call up, I'll never forget him, a brother of mine, Joseph Bolden. When I could call him in, in, in college, man, it's getting tough. Man, you don't need to do that, bro. God got a call in your life. You tripping. Come on. Meet me at 24 hour fitness. Let's go hoop. Hey, bro. Pull up. I'm waiting on you. Where you at? I needed that. I needed that. To where when I was a student pastor, I had teenagers, a group of teenage boys say, hey, I'm going to prom tonight, Jerry. Uh, can I see you my location where you can see where I'm at all night? I'm proud of you, man. You're not going to go to Hotel Derrick with them? I'm going to try not to, but at least if you got my location. <laughs> <laughs> Community. It wasn't from a sermon I taught with them. See, but here's the thing, family. You got to want to be free. If you don't want to be free, you will find friends that help you traffic in secrecy. You will find friends that won't tell if you won't tell. Alicia Keys on them. I won't tell. <laughs> I need somebody to tell me when I'm wrong. Please Acts chapter 4, verse 9. It says, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And when I say community, don't get it twisted. I'm not talking about hundreds of people. Jesus says where two or three are gathered. The way that 2024 is set up, if you find two Christian friends, <laughs> you like community, and I'm trying, if you just got one homie, that's just like, hey, bro, pull up. We're going to hang out tonight so that we don't go back to the hookah bar like you did last weekend. I need Iron to sharpen my iron. Mark chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus even exercises this principle through his ministry tenure. Look at this. Calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out one by one. Okay, Bob, say, he sent them out one by one. He sent them out. Judas, you go by yourself. John, you go by yourself. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. If King Solomon says this and Jesus practices this, what makes you think you don't need body heat? Body heat. For the individual under the sound of my voice who is battling, you're battling to have authentic joy because if you be honest right now, you're plagued by chronic sadness. I feel this, y'all. You're fighting for authentic joy. But if you be honest, you're plagued by chronic sadness. Because please hear me. There's a difference between authentic joy and being distracted from sadness. This is why you scroll so much. 
This is why you have so many subscriptions. Ooh, I'm coming for your joint. This is why you got to get high. This is why you got to drink the Hennessy. This is why you got to get tipsy. You got to get faded. I'm trying to escape sadness, and I'm hoping that this weed, I'm hoping that this alcoholic beverage, I'm hoping that this cheap sex can distract me from how I really feel about myself. And people who don't know you will judge you by your opening act versus your backstage. And they'll say things like, they just got anger issues. You see that girl? She got bad attitude. She got anger problems. See that dude? He got some anger issues. This is what I've learned as being a pastor. Sometimes anger is just prolonged sadness that never came out. You're so angry because you're trying to escape and you can't find it. It's, it's, the, it's the picture in your head of where you thought your life should be by now that's robbing you of joy. Talking to somebody? Woo, God's doing something different on the day. It's the picture in your head, what you thought God should do by now. I'm not preaching to you from a height I haven't experienced. Towards the end of last year, around the holidays, when I was feeling kind of funky, I was like, what is this? And I was talking to Will, and he said, man, remember, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Is it possible that you're looking so hard for a building and praying so hard and casting vision that you're not enjoying what God is doing right now? It's the picture in your head that's robbing you of your joy today. So when things get hard, you run. Ooh, let me put my foot on the gas. All track stars in the room. When a conversation gets difficult, you run. I'm talking about you know who you are. You're the spouse that when a conversation gets on your nerves, you leave the house. You run. Somebody's toe is crunching all under my foot. <laughs> when you don't like something, you run. Can I tell y'all what I've learned? My wife and I have been counseling for at least over a decade. I've learned there's a marriage between runners and childhood. I'm just noticing. When, when, when you have parents who did not understand the psychological long-term effects of telling you to go to your room, because they're overwhelmed or because you did something bad and they say, I don't even know what to do with you right now. Go to your room. What that did was it trained the soul to isolate when overwhelmed. Remember, if you could trace it, you could unlearn it. I'm trying to shine a light on something. When you did wrong, go to your room. So when you sin, you isolate. This is how they could do you wrong and go ghost. Make it make sense. You hurt me. And you went ghost. When I was eight, when I did wrong, go to your room. And I had to deal with the thoughts. I had to deal with all, everything that I was battling with in that moment. And I never was taught how to love even when I fall. How to see myself as worthy of dying for even when I failed. How to see that God gave me an F when my lifestyle right, God gave me an A when my lifestyle right now is an F. Because it's not by works that any man should boast. We've been saved by grace through faith. I've seen, <coughs> I've seen the connection that when they run, that there's this, this stem, this root system that goes all the way back, which is now why I ask, how was your childhood experiences when you got corrected? Because I'm learning. Even when I stud study biblical candidates, I see things in one season that occurred in the next season. Like when I was looking at Moses, he got mad and killed somebody. That anger never got out. So when they were complaining, he got mad again. This is why what I'm doing right now is declaring the truth and the gospel. This is for your destiny. Your therapy is for your history. Because if you don't deal with your history, your history can eclipse your destiny because you could manifest a trauma response to something and disqualify your witness, not because God doesn't love you, but because I have areas that are unhealed. All runners, I want to show you this. I want to talk to you, all runners in the room. Um, I looked at this, Exodus chapter 4. Let's go there real quick. Is this good for somebody? Yes. <laughs> Exodus chapter 4. 
I want us to see this. To give you a little backdrop of what's happening. God is telling Moses, I need you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses has given him all this excuse on why he can't go, which is why I always say your obedience is for somebody's deliverance. The children of Israel were asking God for help. God starts talking to Moses. So everybody who's always saying, God told me, God told me, well, God told me. Okay, is it about you or God's glory? Because whatever God told you is going to make him look good, not you. God told me I should start this. Is this really God telling you or are you chasing clout? So he's having this conversation. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Hold up. Wait a minute. Let, let, okay. Let, let, let's, let's break this down, because I like to put me in the text. Okay. So God says, what is that in your hand? It's a stick. He says, throw it down. He throws it down. It becomes a snake. And he runs. Who wouldn't? I'm sorry. Me and Moses would have been boys. At that, like Moses, I can relate. I don't do snakes. I don't like snakes. I'm never going to have a pet snake. You're never going to see me at the Houston Rodeo holding a snake. I don't entertain snakes. In fact, every snake I see, I treat as though it's venomous. Am I the only one? Like, I... Oh, so y'all, okay, y'all, some of y'all like snakes. I'm going to pray for you, okay? I don't, I don't do snakes. Every snake I see, I treat it like it's venomous. I'm not a herpetologist. That's one who studies reptiles and amphibians. But since I don't know this snake, I'm going to treat it like it's deadly. Ooh, what if we had that with our discernment? What if we were like, you know what, I don't know if this is God or if this is me, so I'm going to treat it like this has the potential to be venomous to my destiny. I'm not going to touch it till I get some divine discernment. I'm not going to sign the contract because I don't know if this is going to be venomous to my resources. So I'm going to wait and see if I get confirmation from God. I'm not a herpetologist. I'm not going to be walking around like, wow, look at here. This is a coral snake and she's a beauty. She's a beauty right here. We have the deadly Western Diamondback Rattler. You want to be careful. She can strike at a whopping 95 miles an hour. Oh, this is the notorious Black Mamba. She's deadly. I'm going to be, I'm good, bro. <laughs> a snake. I'm like, God, you could have turned it into a kitten. You, you, you could have turned it into a squirrel. You, wow, a snake. And then, as I was studying and just asking, because I'd really be looking at the Bible, like, why a snake? Why a snake? It came back. A snake came into the garden. And a snake was the one that spoke to Eve that caused her to influence Adam. And Adam deliberately disobeyed. The serpent in the text constantly tries to think that he has a hold on my people. So I want this to turn into a serpent. And I want you to grab it so that you can know I have given you the authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy. Grab it. He has the stick, throws it down, becomes a snake. He runs from it. God says, grab it. He has the stick, throws it on the ground. It turns into a snake. Moses runs from it. Put my image back up. He runs from it, and God says, grab it. What are you running from that God wants you to seize? What are you running from that God says, seize it? All runners, what are you running from that God has given you the authority to seize? Constantly running, 
PhD in running from, GED in working through. Run from everything, run from problems, stay running on fumes, keep running your mouth and always running red lights. You're sniffing so you have a runny nose, just everything about your life. <laughs> You're a runner. Some of us keep running game like you just run. <laughs> what are you running from? The God says, seize it. Your peace, seize it. Worry, seize it. Doubt, seize it. Anxiety, seize it. Fear, seize it. Your destiny, seize it. Your purpose, seize it. This moment, seize it. Everything about you that is fearful of seizing it, which acronym of fear are you going to live by? Forget everything and run or face everything and rise. Somebody say seize it. Now, that's just a few exegesis of that passage. The next thing that was crazy that God told Moses to do that tripped me out, he didn't just tell him to grab it. He said, grab it by, y'all talk to me, the tail. Okay, once again, I'm not a herpetologist, one who studies reptiles and amphibians. But I do know this. If you're going to grab a snake, you better grab it by his head. But he says, grab it by the tail. Put yourself in the most vulnerable position. Put yourself in a position where you got to trust me. Because I need you to remember, I'm going to crush the head of the serpent. So you don't need to worry about his head. I'm the head. You are the head and not the tail, but I'm going to crush his head, meaning I'm your authority. And I have authority over this serpent. Be vulnerable again. Trust again. This is why some people don't do church. You don't want to be vulnerable again. Trust again. The last time I tried... It hissed at me. And he's saying, I need you to grab it where you're vulnerable to attack. But you trust I won't let you get infected. Now it takes on so much sense. I know why he made it a snake now. Because you have the power to seize what the enemy is trying to do in your life. I don't know who I'm talking to. Whoever the enemy is after your teenager, you have been given the authority by God to seize it. Whatever's going on in your life, he's given you the authority to seize it. So for those who are like, you know, I still, I don't need nobody. Cool, I was watching Animal Planet. <laughs> and I saw this buffalo. Buffalo about to preach a whole word to us. I saw this buffalo because you got to remember, the isolated, the injured, the young and the weak are easy for attack. So I want you to see this. Buffalo by itself. He's done. He got all these lines on him. This is for everybody. Say, I don't need people, but you keep watching porn because nobody knows about your stuff that you're watching. I don't need anybody to help me. They biting all on his butt. He is done. <laughs> He's hollering, and then one dude's like, hold on, homie needs some help. Let's pull up on him. What's up, cuz? <laughs> What's up? You need some, hey, bag, bag off my boy. He said, oh, okay, they trying to mess with Cletus. Let's roll up. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? You need some help? What's up? We got your back. What's up? What's up? We out here. Bag, 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 bag. Give me what's up. <laughs> Looking just at the animal kingdom, that buffalo was done. Lions were like, we about to have some buffalo wings tonight. <laughs> what saved them? Community. community. It wasn't about his horns. It wasn't about his strength. It wasn't about his power. It wasn't about his speed. I know that you're anointed. It's not about that. I know that you're appointed. It's not about that. I know that you're called. It's not about that. I know that you have all these gifts. It's not about that. You are easily overtaken by wolves alone. 
I'm seeing this pattern. People who have podcasts that tear down other ministries don't go to church. <laughs> I'm okay, what church you go to? Tell me about the right one. Since you constantly, this one's a false teacher and this one's a false prophet. Okay, who the real one? What church you go to? Well, I'm in a season of separation. I'm just in the wilderness right now. <laughs> You're easily consumed by wolves when you're alone. Some things you don't get through teaching. You only get through touch. I want to show this to you. I'm looking all throughout the text. Luke chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to go kind of quick because there's a lot of scriptures I want you all to get. Luke chapter 5, verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Somebody say he's unclean. Okay, when Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. He reached out his hand and touched the man. Okay, this is Old Testament problematic because the Old Testament lets us know that anybody who has leprosy is unclean. So if the unclean thing touches the clean thing, the, un the clean thing now becomes unclean. But Jesus, the embodiment of both Testaments, switches it around to where if the unclean thing touches the clean thing and the clean thing touches the unclean thing, the unclean thing now becomes clean because I'm a master physician. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Some things you don't get from teaching. You get from touch. Mark chapter 8 verse 25. Once more Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes. Somebody say touch. touch. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Some things you don't get from teaching. You get from touch. Luke chapter 7 verse 14. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who had been dead. This takes me back to the women's conference back in Atlanta. This funeral has happened. A woman is crying because her son has just died. She already lost her husband. Now she's losing her son. Jesus steps in and touches the coffin. You know what Jesus just said? Pause. This is not going to end in death on today. Pause. This is not going to steal your joy on today. Pause. This is not going to take your peace on today. Pause. I wonder is there anybody? That has been going down a path, but Jesus came in your life and said, pause. Bullet go another direction. Pause. You're not going to die like this. Pause. Death must respect your purpose. Pause. To touch the coffin. I can give you more Bible. Mark chapter 5, verse 25. Now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years... And had suffered many things from many physicians. She spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched. I hope y'all are getting this. Touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes. Listen, this woman who goes nameless, we only know her by her condition and her extension. Y'all missed it. We only know about her from her condition and her extension. She was willing to reach out to touch. And I just think we need to pause right here and get ready to give God a praise because I call it a touchdown miracle. Because ever since Jesus touched me, my anxiety has gone down. My worry has gone down. Insecurity has gone down. Down. You and myself as a failure has gone down. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice in this sacred sanctuary who has ever had his touch? Who is desperate for his touch? We have a high priest who can be touched. Some things you don't get through teaching. You only get through touch. Whatever it takes to make y'all get this. 
I know somebody's like, you don't understand, though. My story, <laughs> I've had so many setbacks, so many discouraging things happen. I've been so defeated. I want you to see something. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. We're going to just launch this at verse 1. It says, listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So you and I are arrows in the hands of God. Okay? So everybody, I'm telling you now, you do not have the right to file a lawsuit. <laughs> Anybody who feels like, you know what, my, my life, I, I've constantly been having setback after setback, disappointment after disappointment, defeat after defeat, discouragement after discouragement. What if what you're calling a setback is actually launching fuel? I told you you do not have the right <laughs> to file a lawsuit. Just, just what if, just what if everybody who's like, I'm good, I, I don't need nobody. If you have a life that's full of sunshine, you can't launch forward. It's, it's actually the trials of life. It's the testing it's the battles that gives me the fuel. Left side, here we go. For me to be able to launch. Did that hit you? Did I reach you? It reached you? But I couldn't reach you if I didn't go through that. See? I couldn't touch you if I didn't go through that. I would be powerless to reach you. Gosh, I hope y'all are getting this. There's some people you won't even be able to reach if you don't go through that. But I use the trials, I use the tests, I use the pressing, I use the fights, I use the storms. It just launched me forward to be more faithful. It launched me forward to be more holy. And people will say things like, you're an overnight success. No, I've just been faithful. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it is. You didn't see me fighting to renew my mind. You didn't see me fighting to crucify, crucify my flesh. You don't know the tears that I've cried because I'm trying to keep my purity. You don't know what it was like when my body was saying doing one thing, but the spirit was saying do another thing. And I fought and I was faithful and I was persistent and I was consistent. And then now God can get the glory because of my faithfulness. Whoever feels like you're being pulled back, I'm trying to let you know God is just going to launch you forward with it. Because we're arrows in his hands. So let me give you some points so we can go home. You do not have the right to file a lawsuit. <laughs> a lot of us confuse loneliness with solitude. Okay? Oftentimes, loneliness can arrive when the Sabbath principle has been violated. All you do is work, 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 work. So then when something like a pandemic happens, when COVID happens and you're forced to be alone, loneliness will walk in your living room with a cup of Starbucks, a Danish, and say, hello. <laughs> you thought you could outwork me? You thought you could avoid me? That wasn't deliverance. That was avoidance. Since we don't know how to rest. Resting is showing God I trust you with the outcome, not my grind. I, I trust you. This is how we can confuse loneliness with solitude. Loneliness often also arrives when the reason of your birth has been undiscovered. Man, I'm so bored. No, your gifts are hibernating. If you would use your gifts, you would have to tell yourself to go to sleep because you would want to keep working your gift. And I need to stop for tonight. I have to literally set an alarm enough for tonight. So when you don't know why you're here, like this woman with the issue of blood, you'll be searching for physicians who leave you in a worse condition. 
Whenever you look for a relationship to be your physician, they'll always give you wrong prescriptions. It's, it's the touch of Jesus that we need. The difference between solitude and isolation is solitude is chosen separation for refining and refueling your soul. Okay? Isolation is your attempt to protect self or not be held accountable. One more time. Solitude is a chosen separation for refining or retuning, even rejuvenating the soul. Isolation is your attempt to protect self or not be held accountable. Where did you get this from? Jesus. In his ministry, he constantly sought out solitude. Because purpose requires for you to pour. Watch this. The question is, what are you pouring and where are you pouring? Because you don't, you don't pour out your joy. Purpose requires for you to pour. So, like when I pour and I say, okay, Isaac or whoever, y'all hold it down this week, that's rejuvenating. I'm not lonely. That solitude is refreshing. So solitude is when you're being rejuvenated. Loneliness, I'm being aggravated. I'm being aggravated because I think my effectiveness comes from a duet versus a solo. A few points. Now let's go home. Number one, body heat feeds your flame. Remember, body heat is authentic believers who collectively make up his body who are engulfed with the fire of God. So Christian community feeds your flame. You feel yourself getting dull? Come to community. I don't feel like going to church. That's when you should. I don't, that's when you should. My spouse just acting, they don't, they, they don't deserve love today. That's when they need it the most. Feeds your flame. Number two, body heat helps with life needs. We're battling a cold in the flowers house. Sister Celestine makes us some soup. What if we were isolated? I don't need nobody. All of us sick. Tanisha's sick. Josiah's sick. Jerry's sick. I'm sick. Who gonna make the stew? We better Uber Eats. <laughs> but when you have community, you're moving. What do you need? You need a truck? Don't rent U-Haul. You can use mine. I got you. I, I don't have enough gas. Okay, we'll pick you up. It helps with life needs. I'm going to say something strong, but it's something I've just seen as a pastor. When you isolate yourself, when you experience death in your family, it will show you that you've been an island. When nobody calls, nobody reaches out, nobody sees how you're doing, you're experiencing how you lived and how you treated people. Fights usually happen in our funerals. Not in the church, but as they're planning for the events. Fighting, 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 fighting. And those who are takers, not servers, when crisis hits, when you fall alone, who could pick you up? Those who are service, servers, you have to almost tell people, okay, y'all, I got enough, I need a minute. Because so many people will rally around you because you will serve to a fault. It helps with life needs. Simply put, you don't know how much you're going to need somebody in the next season. So serve everybody in this season that you can. Number three, body heat exposes what needs to burn up. What needs to burn up? There are certain things that I didn't even recognize I was struggling with until I have other husbands tell me, hey, bro, that, that, no, nah, this is what you got to do. Okay, bet I, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about it. the conversations I have with other husbands. Man, a wife, she just been on one today. All right, text her that you love her. Man, she been, she been tripping. I know, but it worked. It works. <laughs> what, 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 what's her favorite ice cream? Bro, I ain't doing all that, man. It ain't about you. It's, a, it's, it's, it's killing pride. It's loving your wife like Christ loved the church. 
gave himself up for her. When she comes home, have her ice cream, have dinner made, maybe a little letter say just because. That's it. What you're doing is putting hot coals on her head. The Bible says, do good to those. You're putting hot coals on their head. I'm going to be good to you, even when you're not being good to me. And since I know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit going to wear you out. <laughs> but what do you do when you're with the carnal man or the carnal woman? Nobody convicts them. Hold another sermon. Number four. Body heat gives you an opportunity to serve. It's in community. You have a chance to give back. Number five, body heat protects you from wolves. We just saw a natural example of a buffalo that was getting overran, but community helped him. Number six, body heat gives you sound doctrine. You must learn how to fight with your sword. You can't control every thought that flies through your mind, but you can't control what lands. And having the sword that reminds you, whatever's pure, whatever's noble, whatever's just, whatever's of good report, think on these things, that helps. Number seven, body heat helps you discover your kingdom family. Sometimes this will be more family than your blood. Thank you for the one golf clap. Can we give God praise just for community? Yeah. This, you might find a brother here that's more of a brother, brother to you than your blood brother. A sister here that is more of a sister to you than your blood sister. Father figures, mother figures, a Naomi that can help you in ways your natural mother can. But you wouldn't find that without the body. So I just felt led by the Holy Spirit to just speak on, hey, we need community. However, we need it to be biblical, on fire for the things of God. And most importantly, got to be healthy. So God, thank you for your body. For anybody who's battling with trusting or trying again, I pray that you give them the discernment to find healthy, holistic kingdom communities. Rather it's two, three, five, ten, whatever it may be, God. Remind us that we're called to be a part of an army. We're not just a soldier, but we're soldiers in your army. We're not an audience, we're an army, God, and I pray that you temper the hearts of those who have had bad church experiences. Just like they wouldn't stop listening to a song due to a bad singer who tried to sing it. Help us to not throw away the necessity of body heat because we got burnt from one place. And God, we just want to say thank you for dying on the cross so that we could even be a part of the body. And we can't wait to one day there's no need for the moon, no need for the stars, because your glory fills the temple and we'll all be together with you. Help us to be heaven focused. Everything of this life will fade, pass away. If it could burn, if it can corrode, if it could rust, if it could deteriorate, it's vanity. Help us to always be focused on what matters most. Giving you glory and reigning with you and bringing as many souls as we can. While we're here in time, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.